Hello, everybody. I hope everybody is doing well today. Um, sorry, I am a little late on this presentation. I've been uh, kind of running around this weekend. Uh, but um, I have this lecture up there on Blackboard for you, and I will try to be a little bit more diligent next week to get them up um, like on a Tuesday and Thursday um, so you can watch it before the weekend. Or you know, Now you have something to watch on the weekend if you want to. Uh, but this shouldn't be too long. This presentation is going to go over the wonderful world of fracking, right? Um, like I told you, we're going to start getting into um, natural gas and then oil. And I figured that uh, maybe I should, you know, I want to break those into different presentations. Maybe I should do one just on fracking because um, this is basically how we are getting our um, oil and natural gas in the years to come and then as you'll see throughout this uh, presentation here so in this presentation we're going to learn about the concept of hydraulic fracturing and the benefits and consequences okay it's going to be an overview of how we are extracting the majority of our oil and natural gas all right and then the next two presentations next next uh, week we will talk about how we convert that and what we use it for and all that other rigmarole but this is just such a controversial uh, topic um, and it's really a hot topic today and remember that your uh, uh, presentation what you got to do for your presentation is due on Monday and this is an excellent topic I mean even if both of you guys did it I want to have two people in this class so even if both of you did it I wouldn't mind because this is a very very uh, high, you know, hot button topic okay and you can do whatever you want for your presentation just don't forget that that is due on Monday all right, uh, just email me that, then we'll say, I'll say yay or nay, okay? And also, let's try to uh, work on a day uh, to get together on the farm, if you guys still wish. I will bring that up on Monday when I post the uh, weekly overview, okay? So don't forget to check back on Monday, too, um, because I'll put the overview of what we're going to do week uh, two. And um, we'll try to figure something out for the uh, uh, farm tour to see the solar panels right after we finish up the renewable energy section. Okay, so last week we talked our last presentation we talked about coal, and the way we've gotten coal has changed. All right, we've gone from that human mining to technology, and it's really gotten kind of easier than more complicated. All right, because now we're not you know uh, going through those seams and sending people down on uh, wood carts and uh, you know, mules and human labor with pickaxes. We have technology that can bore right through that little coal seam through the side of the hill and, you know, no, hardly any human labor needed. Or we can just blow up the top of the mountain. And uh, one of the problems is a lot of those coal seams then uh, fill up with water. And, you know, there's some environmental damage and stuff like that. And they, they, I talked about the one that was on fire. Um, but even when we do mountaintop removal, it just kind of destroys the environment, as you can see in this little picture. All right. Um, but, you know, the process has actually become cheaper to do than it actually has become more expensive. All right. We talked about the, you know, the, the low hanging fruit of apples. A lot of our fossil fuels, our non renewable energies, are, you know, were low hanging apples on that tree. We picked them all. All right. And that is never so more uh, evident in the oil and gas industry. Okay, for this energy that we use. Um, so a typical oil and gas well, as much as two-thirds of the deposit, may actually uh, remain in the ground after the primary extraction. All right? So uh, we need to, we, we want to be able to capture all that stuff. We kind of talked about carbon sequestration with coal um, last uh, presentation, where they would take that carbon and write it that fuel state, fuel, flu, all right, and just pump that, stuff right back into the ground and that helps you know put more pressure into that cavity below on the ground and that forces the oil and the gas up to um, so we can capture it fine all right and this is called secondary extraction all right and sometimes some solvents and water and steam is used just to be injected all right to recapture that stuff that's remaining in that nice little jelly donut as we'll see here in a second uh, but fracking is actually different, right? It is actually a directional drilling technology. It allows the drillers not to bore down vertically, um, but they bore down vertically and they go sideways, right? And they drill horizontally and they just take right, right inside that seams. And this allows them to drill 
drill is to reach large radius of each drill pad um, without constructing a whole bunch of different drill pads, all right, to get to the oil and that. So what really is happening, you know, visually here is we used to have these old oil and gas wells, all right, and it was just like a big jelly donut, and we would just drill on down and get to that nice creamy filling in the middle, okay? And when we talk about the secondary, what we do is we pump in that CO2 or some steam or some water and solvents, and that would force all the jelly off the side of the donut down here so we could suck it back out, all right? But nowadays, man, we're out of these little pools of nice little areas for the oil and natural gas. So we have to do a little bit more technology. We come down here and we drill and go sideways and find that nice little seam. All right, you see all these wiggly lines. That's what's called a fracking is. And we're going to see a video about, about this procedure in just a little bit here. Okay, so you can see it's gone a little bit tougher uh, for us to get this out. And this is a lot more expensive than mountaintop removal. All right, you know, and I say that as in uh, just true cost. If you look at, I um, shouldn't say true cost because I believe externalities are actually a cost also, we lose that mountain. And that's a big expense. That is a loss of a natural resource we can never get back. All right? There's a lot of ecological services on the hills of West Virginia that we are losing. And that, that's not put into the equation. All right? And as an ecological economist, that's why I try to put in the equation as well. And this you know, saves that kind of stuff. All right? So then I'm like, you know, dig it on down. And you think about it, we really can't get to the oil and natural gas this way. The coal, we can't because we can't suck that coal out. Right, that's not a, a liquid uh, or a gas, uh, so we have to dig it out, and this is the only way we can really do it today. And this technology has actually been around for years since the late 1950s. <clears throat> um, but recently, fracking has become a major debate in the states above the Marsala Shale deposit. And that's where we live, we live right above the well, I live, uh, you guys might move away someday, but Robert Morris is right on top of the Marsala Shale deposits. And it has created so many jobs in this area, and uh, and around the around in the other areas that it, that it, um, that we frack in as well, and we'll see that here in a little bit. Um, but it also drew down water resources, and in some cases, it's actually polluted the water. And the response to the public outcry to the oil and gas industry is beginning to uh, is starting to respond to it. It's starting to reuse some water and they're starting to take care of the contamination a little bit more. All right. And they're doing some good things. And that's due to some of the public pressure that uh, has been bestowed upon them. Because no company, you know, a company's main uh, objective is to maximize profits. So if they can get out of some of these regulations, they're going to do it. That's just the, the nature of the game. Um, but we as a society also need to stand up and say, hey, no, we can't do that. We need to put in those costs, okay? I don't want anybody to go out of business, but I want them to do the business safe, okay? So what is hydraulic fracturing, okay? Um, let me get out of this, and I have the video up. So if you download this video, this PowerPoint, this video is uh, embedded in here, but I got it up so I don't have to uh, worry about it too much. So let's let's look at this uh, little video. This explains kind of like the process and a little overview, and I like this one because it's not too, you know, it's, it's kind of equal weighted, all right, because this is a very, very controversial subject, and we'll, we'll discuss, you know, two different sides at the very end of this program, all right, but it's important for you as a student, and, you know, put on your critical thinking skills and listen to both sides of the story and assess the, the situation properly, all right, and then come to your conclusion, but do your research, all right, try to put down your biases and look at uh, everything this video talks about. You'll see there's a lot of different things, all right? And I'll point some stuff out after we watch it. So let's give this little video a watch um, is and hydraulic see what it has to say. Or fracking. Since the Industrial Revolution, our energy consumption has risen unceasingly. <clears throat> the majority of this energy consumption is supplied by fossil fuels like coal or natural gas. Recently, there's been a lot of talk about a controversial method of extracting natural gas, hydraulic fracturing, or fracking. Put simply, fracking describes the recovery of natural gas from deep layers inside the earth. In this method, porous rock is fractured by the use of water, sand and chemicals in order to release the enclosed natural gas. The technique of fracking has been known since the 1940s. 
Yeah, we've known how to do this for a long, long time. It just hasn't been economically. Has been quite a fracking boom, especially it just hasn't been USA. economically feasible for us to do it. All right, and we'll talk about some of the economics behind it here coming up. Um, but we have known how to do this. It's, it's nothing new. Okay, it just hasn't been. This is because Profitable. most conventional natural gas sources in America and on the European continent have been exhausted. Thus, prices for natural gas and other fuels are rising steadily. Significantly more complicated and expensive methods, like fracking, have now become attractive and profitable. In the meantime, fracking has already been used more than a million times in the USA alone. Over 60% of all new oil and gas wells are drilled by using of the new fracking. Wells. Now, let's take a look at how fracking actually works. First, a shaft is drilled several hundred meters into the earth. From there, a horizontal hole is drilled into the gas-bearing layer of rock. Next, the fracking fluid is pumped into the ground using high-performance pumps. On average, the fluid consists of 8 million liters of water which amounts to about the daily consumption of 65,000 people, plus several thousand tons of sand and about 200,000 liters of chemicals. The mixture penetrates into the rock layer and produces innumerable tiny cracks. The sand prevents the cracks from closing again. The chemicals perform various tasks. Among other things, they compress the water, kill off bacteria or dissolve minerals. Next, the majority of the fracking fluid is pumped out again. And now the natural gas can be recovered. As soon as the gas source is exhausted, the drill hole is sealed. As a rule, the fracking fluid is pumped back into deep underground layers and sealed in there. However, fracking is also associated with several considerable risks. The primary risk consists in the contamination of drinking water sources. Fracking not only consumes large quantities of fresh water, but in addition, the water is subsequently contaminated and is highly toxic. The contamination is so severe that the water cannot even be cleaned in a treatment plant. Even though the danger is known and... Th yeah, this is very important about the water not being able to be cleaned. Uh, we use a ton of water in this fracking process, and it comes out radioactive. Um, seriously, there were my, one of my friends actually works in this industry, uh, driving a truck back and forth, and uh, of the water. And he has a little thing, a little radio radioactivity monitor on his little uniform in his truck to make sure that he's not getting a radioactive waste um, emitting from that water into his cab and hence uh, making him radioactive. All right? And that's done just by the natural forces of the... Uh, the, 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 the earth, you know, law of thermodynamics is what's called radon in the ground. And that's just natural decaying radioactive waste. And when we disturb that uh, ground, that radioactive waste gets uh, emitted. You might, when you get a house someday, or if you already have a house, you might have had a, what's called a radon uh, test to make sure that your house doesn't have radon coming in and you don't get cancer in 10 years. Uh, but that's how what's happened in the water, and it's very, very. Uh, it comes out so toxic. We just take it, we then we frack, and then we we put it down in the ground so you don't come back. Uh, we take it to Youngstown, or we take it to our, um, I think I want to say Kentucky, uh, St. Louis, Illinois, and you know, put it down there in that shell bed. Theoretically, could be managed. In the USA already, sources have been contaminated due to negligence. No one yet knows how the enclosed water will behave in the future since there have not yet been any long-term studies on the subject. The chemicals used in fracking vary from the hazardous to the extremely toxic and carcinogenic, such as benzol or formic acid. The companies using fracking say nothing about the precise composition of the chemical mixture. So we know what is actually in the fracking fluids, all these different... Uh elements okay um but they don't need to uh release the secret recipe okay so we know the ingredients just not the amounts and to properly allocate uh you know environmental standards to see what is generally considered safe 
we as a society need to know these amounts, how much formic acid is in there, so we can say, okay, you put this much in, we'll still be safe. You put that much in, we're not going to be safe. But we don't know what the total is. Okay, and that is one of the biggest controversies are going on in this. Are they allowed to have the secret sauce recipe like Coca Cola and keep it as a proprietary um, invention? Okay, uh, yes, they disclose you know the what's inside Coca Cola. So there's sugar and car and caramel and oh you know whatever whatever is in a Coca Cola on an ingredients lab, but they don't tell you exactly how it's made. And how much sugar is in it and all that other stuff. Well, I guess I have to tell you the sugar count. Um, but that is one of the biggest controversies, too. We want to find out as a society. We're going back and forth in the court system to try to find out if we can get that. So far, um, the frackers have won. Okay, so I don't know if we'll ever find out the exact recipe. But it is known that there are about 700 different chemical agents which can be used in the process. Another risk is the release of greenhouse gases. The natural gas recovered by fracking consists largely of methane, a greenhouse gas which is 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Natural gas is less harmful than coal when burned. But nonetheless, the negative effects of fracking on the climate balance are overall greater. Firstly, the fracking process requires a very large consumption of energy. Secondly, the drill holes are quickly exhausted and it's necessary to drill fracking holes much more frequently decreasing the rate of return for energy in addition e about 3% of the recovered gas is lost in the extraction and escapes into the atmosphere so how is fracking and its expected benefits to be assessed when the advantages are in this 3% um, extra that is escaping is that's the industry standard that's just the way it happens sometimes it's even up to 10% but methane is actually a higher, uh, a more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide itself. And as we increase the well size, we increase that 3%, we increase the more greenhouse gases we have in the atmosphere. It does not last, methane does not last as long in the atmosphere as, as carbon dioxide. It kind of switches to carbon dioxide after a couple of years, well, like 50 or something like that. So it takes some time. It's quicker. Uh, but it still has a bigger impact. It's four times. It captures four times the amount of latent heat that a carbon dioxide does. And as we increase our fracking, we're increasing this number too. Okay. Gas is lost in the extraction and escapes into the atmosphere. So how is fracking and its expected benefits to be assessed when the advantages are balanced against the disadvantages? When properly employed, this technique offers one way in the short to medium term to meet our demand for lower cost energy. But the long term consequences of fracking are unforeseeable and the risk to our drip. See, I like how he says this. This is expected benefits to be assessed when the advantages are balanced against the disadvantages. When properly employed, this technique offers one way in the short to medium term short to, to meet medium our term demand for lower cost to make energy. our long term. But the long term consequences what is the long -term? are unforeseen. All we have is a long term consequence. We don't have the long term should not benefits. Be underestimated. That is one of my biggest pet peeves about this. And we're going to talk about this in just a second. But as we, you know, I love that very ending. He says, from the short to medium term, it is expected to uh, you know, help us out. All right. And they, can't, they, they talk about uh, this fracking method being a bridge fuel to renewable energies. Okay, and I'm, I'm okay with that as long as we do uh, complete that bridge um, to um, complete that bridge to renewable energies. Okay, that, that's a big, a big uh, we have to do. Okay, so that's basically the basic concept of hydraulic factory. We use this sand and chemicals and we drill down there and go sideways and we put off all these little explosions and the uh, gas and the natural gas and the oil just kind of seep on out okay and like i said this is a big big thing in our uh, area it's called the, the marcella shale area and you can see this little area right here is all where the marcella shells in pittsburgh is smack dab in the middle right um and there's a video a movie we'll talk about at the very end here called gas Land. 
it, it really went and saw these people um, in this Marsala area, actually endemic. Okay, um, this is where they first started drilling or fracking in Pennsylvania. Now they're moving out here to the Allegheny and Beaver and uh, Washington County. First they went to Washington and then went to Allegheny. Now they're out here in Beaver County uh, doing it. Uh, but endemic Pennsylvania, the royalty money that these people got for leasing out the land um, and getting the rights to get the natural uh, uh, natural uh, gas out of the ground was an economic boom for that area. All right, Dimick had some of the highest producing wells of Marsala Shale and a massive underground gas bearing rock uh, rock formation, and it really boosted the economy. Um, for that area okay it was a big you know, sudden boom and this happens everywhere we do the fracking okay if you go up and look at uh, do a case study maybe in the north dakota fracking area that we've done um this is more about the oil because that's where the oil is holy guacamole they they were their unemployment rate was like nothing and people were sleeping in the cars because they didn't have enough hotels all right they were paying 20 bucks an hour at the mcdonald's because they needed workers I mean, it was it was a huge boom, and today it's not uh, the same picture, okay? Uh, but endemic, you know, they had that economic boom, but all of a sudden, some of the residents began experiencing uh, the contamination in their water, drinking water, and it, it smelled with a chemical smell, and uh, some people could even, like, light their uh, faucets on fire, right? And they started blaming it on the hydraulic fracturing that was happening, all right? Um, and this makes sense because everything was okay until they started fracking, okay? And, you know, and when you, you know, as engineers, problem solvers, you kind of figure out, hey, what did I change first? It's been working up to this point, and all of a sudden it's something, uh, something went wrong. So did I change anything? And what did I change? What, what did they change in this area as they started fracking? Um, they didn't have this problem before, and now they have it. All right, water and sand and chemicals are pumped into this, this you know, fracking thing, and, and it started, started to seep into the waterways. All right, so you got here the pump of the, the uh, pumps of trucks that inject the sand and chemicals into the thing. So they drill down with the drill rig, and then afterwards they come with these big, huge water trucks. And this is the fresh water that's you know, usually drinkable, and they send it down in there. And what I always say to a lot of people is that, uh, you know, it can percolate up, all right? So as this water is going down, it fills up this little area, and sometimes it can get in and start contaminating into the aquifer, all right? Or the, because you're going to have a whole bunch of different cracks. I mean, these, these cracks right here are caused by the fracking, all right? But there's going to be kind of cracks where the oil and gas, or not the oil and gas, the uh, chemicals and water can percolate up into this aquifer, so they have to be very, very careful, all right? Because you see here, there's a casing of the cement that goes through this aquifer, and then they send this stuff down through, okay? This casing is not uh, completed correctly. Um, it could just all get right into the aquifer, come right back up this pipe, all right? So, um, and I think they say about 10% of these wells are I think that's the industry average. Um, I'll have to double check that that number. All right, but the industry is honest about it. Okay. Uh, fracking, like I said, fracking got greatly boosts uh, natural gas um, that can be extracted for the rock formations, and it has ignited a U.S. gas production boom. All right, and this boom has employed thousands of people, reduced the price of natural gas dramatically. When they started fracking, like I said, when they did fracking for oil, it was about 100 bucks a barrel. This was about 15 bucks a cubic foot. Now, oh, uh, natural gas is traded for about 350 a cubic foot, all right? And hence, the, the economic numbers aren't really right there for them to keep on making money. Uh, but we'll have to see what happens with the gas. It's a little bit different than the uh, oil and just fracking on for the oil. <clears throat> Policy makers have definitely encouraged fracking even passing exemptions to major federal laws for the National Environmental Policy Act and Safe Drinking Water Act, right? <laughs> if you go back and you do, you know, some research on um, how this industry got, you know, supported and stuff, you'll hear about what, uh, what they call the Halliburton loophole, right? 
And the Halliburton loophole is the frackers get away from uh, having to pay, having to um, disclose things underneath the Safe Water Drinking Act. And that's because instead of using one big, like if you see just like a big hole plant, you, can, you know, it's a nice uh, point source pollution, we call it. All right, we can see that coal plant. We know what's going in. We know what's going out. All right. Uh, however, remember fracking has these, all these little tiny individual wells. All right. So there'll be like one well, one well, and then three miles later there'll be another well, and three miles from there there'll be another well. So there's all these this peckle, this peppering of wells all over the landscape. And since each well is so small, they decide that it doesn't have to fall under the Safe Drinking Water Act. Not one big institution, like the big power plant, each one is so small that, you know, it's hard to say who was the one, which well actually contaminated the water, all right? And they, that's the way they get around the Safe Drinking Water Act. And they call it um, the Halliburton Loophole. There's a little bit more to it, too, but they call it the Halliburton Loophole. The Halliburton Loophole is because they, Halliburton is one of the people that own this technology. And when this was passed, the uh, president, the vice president of the United States, Dick Cheney, and he was getting a nice pension from Halliburton. He was the CEO of Halliburton for a long, long time. All right, so that has a nickname of the Halliburton loophole. Uh, but it's a very interesting story because the gas companies do not have to report any of the chemical additives um, they use for fracking and they or test for toxic chemicals presented in their wastewater. They don't have to do that stuff. All right, because of this bypass, because of this loophole in the, in the laws. Uh, so a, date, a debate uh, erupted in the town, in that little Demi Green, all right, of uh, whose wells were impacted um, and the other residents who felt the benefits outweighed the risks. So, you know, they had a big, huge debate in this area. Uh, the Pennsylvania DEP, DEP eventually fined Cabot and forced them to bring in drinking water, hauled in from other areas. Um, because the citizens could never could not drink out of their well water anymore. Um, but this practice ended when the new governor uh, came in and um, he strongly supported uh, fracking and kind of got rid of some of that stuff. Um, so it depends on who you vote for too when it comes down to fracking. It's a very political issue. The U.S. Uh, EPA eventually stepped in and found that uh, five out of the 64 tested water wells were contaminated. Uh, but uh, Cabot did step in and said it was addressing the problems and the issues. Um, some residents and scientists expect the EPA policies are being influenced by the lobbyists. So, you know, this, this is such a new subject out there. There's always, they are doing this and they're doing that. There's going to be two sides of the story. And you, very, you need to be careful and read both sides of the story. Explore both sides of the story. And then use your critical thinking skills and decide who do you think is really telling the truth. All right, after you look at all the different data out there, okay? Because the fracking industry often uh, leads to flush high-paying jobs and acti economic activity, um, but uh, that seems to outweigh the potential environmental costs. But we got to remember, this is a long-term. Remember in that video, they said it's a nice little bridge fuel from short to medium, but there's some long-term effects. It's not going to be a long-term solution, that's for sure. Okay, we already admit that. It's only about 90 years. I can't remember what, what that number was we get on that uh, homework assignment. Right? Uh, but we, I, I made you look up those years to expiration, uh, years to, you know, we were out of proven reserves. Um, so it's not going to be a long-term solution for us. Okay, It's definitely going to be a short-term. And there's long-term consequences that we do not know about. We have, we're, you know. I like to use what's called the precautionary principle. Don't put it out there until we know what's going on. Um, but here in America, we kind of use the, hey, you're the guinea pig um, policy instead. So North Dakota, Texas, Colorado, and Pennsylvania are all developing case studies. So this is ongoing research. And we need in good, smart engineers to go out there and try to collect some of this data to see if it's hurting the environment, but also great, smart engineers so we can do this more economically efficient, all right, and be more honest about what's happening out there and make it safer, okay? I have no problems with working with people to try to make this as safe as possible. Uh, shale gas drilling has created uh, external costs. You know, there's, there's uh, health problems. You see this lady here. Lighting their uh, faucet on fire, too. 
Um, so we need to create a strong monitoring and data collection system. All right, it definitely needs to be made for this industry. It's, it's I, in my humble opinion, I think it's lacking. All right, uh, but we need smart engineers to figure out how we're going to do it and get it in place. All right, because fracking really isn't going anywhere, and it really has uh, made our industry what our industry is. Okay, remember we talked about um, how oil is, you know. I guess we'll talk about a more on the oil section, but our oil production definitely has gone up over the years, all right? And that is all due to uh, fracking, all right? So monthly crude oil and natural gas well count by type. So you can see up here, okay, is going straight on up, right? Well, the conventional horizontal drill uh, is going straight down, all right? So it's definitely being replaced. And we're definitely using this more and more and more in the um, industry. Okay, and that's the only reason why we have that oil export that we see in the EIA um, information. The only reason we are able to produce what we've produced in the oil and natural gas system is because of this fracking. And it's, going, it's growing exponentially. So it's not going to go anywhere. All right, we're going to have to be able to live with it, but we need to also... Uh, try to deal with it, all right? Um, so you can see here for the natural gas. So this was just oil. This is the fracking of oil, all right? So this is the horizontal rigs, is, you know, for the oil. This is the fracking of oil. But here's uh, the increase of the fracked natural gas, okay? And you can see right here that the black line is the Marsala, Pennsylvania, all right? Um, we started here in the Bartlett, Texas is one of the first ones, all right? Because it was the most easiest to get to and uh, headquarters and stuff like that. Um, but you see it started to level off after a while. This is one of my favorite, the Haynesville. All right, you can see that one's already peaked, all right? And then the Marsala shell just taken off, all right? We're definitely uh, the hot spot because we kind of used all the Barton and the Haynesville. Okay, this is the next big one. Um, Eagle Fort's coming, being built up, but it's really... Uh, secondary to this part. There's not as much as it. Okay. In the Balkan, it's gone nowhere. Okay. Uh, but the use of natural gas is definitely going to be needed in the future. Okay. Here in uh, Pennsylvania, that Marsala shale, the stuff here in Pittsburgh in this area is actually going down to Alaquipa for a frat, for a cracker plant to make plastic out of. All right. Um, but with the CO2 emissions nowadays, uh, we are trying to get rid of coal and put in natural gas. Okay, and you can see how natural gas is increased um, for the production of electricity while coal is slowly going down. Okay, and this is basically just due to um, CO2 emissions. Okay, because natural gas has less CO2. But we got to remember we have to do the whole equation, the whole throughput equation. And when we're getting that natural gas out, we're putting 3% of methane into the atmosphere. Okay, and I don't know if that. 3% of methane is actually counted in this just CO2 emissions, all right? So we need to balance out the equation and do a proper um, benefit analysis, okay? So there's a document, documentary out there that started, that, you know, started the biggest controversy, the controversy of a fracking, okay? And it's called Ga Gasland, all right? And this movie is actually free for you guys to watch on YouTube. So if you have nothing to do this weekend, may I suggest you go to YouTube and put in Gasland, all right? And they will give you the free uh, movie. So it was a documentary uh, made, I think this is like the 15th year anniversary or something. And it's really started all the controversy that you see out there on the political stage when they ask the proponents, of, you know, the Green New Deal people, all this stuff, this was like kind of like one of the beginning uh, motivations for that movement, right? It's a very, very interesting documentary. And there is a lot of documentation that supports the stuff that he talks about in this film, okay? So if you feel like it, it's about an hour and 45 minutes, like if I wait 42 minutes, um, give it a watch this weekend or sometime soon. I, I think you might re enjoy it, all right? But having said that, um, it's also important that you look at the other side, okay? So Josh Fox, the guy who made this, is, you know, everybody's going to give him a bad rap. He's still a nice guy. 
And then there's the Marcel Show Coalition, who rebuts stuff that he says. All right. So put on Marcel Show Share Coalition, you'll find all these good things that they talk about too. All right. So it's, you know, the other side of the, uh, the coin. All right. And as a critical thinker and as a, you know, master student, you need to, uh, you need to, uh, excuse me, you need to look at both sides of the story and, you know, access what is best. All right. Because these people at the Marsala Shale, you know, don't forget to look on the other side. They talk about, you know, it's been over a billion dollars have been invested by PA Shale industry in the roads and infrastructure improvements uh, since 2008. Um, I, I, I look over those reports, all right? <laughs> I don't know if they've really invested that much. I, I have a fracking wells on my street. And I got eight new uh, potholes, okay? But shale production um, increased the U.S. household incomes, uh, by the average of twelve hundred bucks, makes sense. Okay, uh, two point one billion in tax revenue has been uh, generated. Right, we could have a lot more tax revenue uh, because they don't pay what's called a. Uh, oh, geez, I can't remember the name of that tax. Well, there's a tax uh, that West Virginia has and New York has. Everybody else has except for us. The severance tax is called, and that's to help pay for the roads. Right. And the more, and Pennsylvania is the only state that doesn't have it. And, and the, the, the proponents will say, well, they won't come here and frack if we have the severance tax. And you know what I say to them? That, that, that uh, natural gas ain't going nowhere, right? And we need to pay for those roads because I got eight potholes right in front of my house, okay? Uh, and also they talk about it as being a bridge fuel, right? Um, to be, um, to get us to, uh, renewable energies. 96% of all new industry hires were um, made from the Appalachian Basin. Okay. Um, so the hiring the local people, uh, the U.S. has surpassed Russia. Uh, but, you know, I take that with a grain of salt as well because um, when you got a whole bunch of sanctions on you, so you can't uh, do. Uh, Natural gas, no wonder we're beating that. Okay, 45 billion uh, consumer utility costs were saved because natural gas is actually cheaper than coal. All right, that's, we're not only switching over to natural gas to be able to produce uh, for lower greenhouses, it's actually we get a better bang for a buck than coal. Okay, you know, taking apart that mountain really is not, not that economically efficient. It looks nice and easy and all this other stuff, but the cost. Uh, for all that stuff really does not equate as well as it does for a fracking. Um, in 2013, Safe Shale Development supported uh, 245,000 PA jobs with an average core job paying about 90 grand a year. Okay, yeah, there's jobs, 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 baby. Uh, 630 million was distributed uh, overwhelmingly to the local communities and natural gas impact fees, right? That's kind of like that severance tax. But, you know, these impact fees are kind of like, hey, you messed it up, you gotta, gotta clean it up, right? And 1.7 million jobs, all right? And this is, you know, a broad base to look at how they uh, increase the jobs in restaurants and things like that. So yes, there are some pros to fracking, all right? But there's also some negatives. And as a society, we need to decide whether or not we want to keep on pursuing these, all right? So in conclusion, fracking is an impressive technology. It really is. It's been around since the 1940s, and it's come a long way, all right? Research uh, on, it, on its impact is really incomplete. We really need to do something in society and step up uh, to the lobbyists and the big people and say, hey, we need to properly equate this because I don't want my kids getting poisoned, Okay. And not saying that they're doing it on our purpose and it's really that bad, but why be afraid of it, all right? And it can be a bridge to renewable. It is That is a nice thought, and I hope that it works out. Uh, but it's uh, estimated somewhere around like 90 years we're going to run out of the, the reserve, so we better get on it and start those renewables, okay? In my humble opinion, I call it insanity. 
going, you know, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. We might as well just go to renewables. But I'll take anything I can get. Okay. Uh, fracking, fracking most likely. So fracking, fracking most likely will not leave us anytime soon. It's going to be around for a while. We still need, uh, you know, importance of some of those carbon chains when we're trying to um, at least make some of the plastics. So some of those plastics that we make are, are um, we get uh, from our natural gas are a lot better than we get from a, a plant because you know, it's a fried French wine you know, carbon chain. And when we turn that into a plastic, that plastic is really good. We need some medical devices and things like that that really last. Okay. Um, so it won't go away anytime soon. We'll always have a little bit of natural gas and oil that we're fracking out of the ground. So economics will be the final decision maker, though. As long as it's feasible, as long as it's there, um, and I should say maybe a little bit of technology, because hopefully the renewable technology will take over um, and make it totally infeasible. Okay. Um, so that's it on the fracking um, section. Okay. So I will get this posted on the internet for you. And then check back on Monday, and we will review what's to be expected on Monday or next week for week three. And I'll put up the uh, natural gas uh, PowerPoint. Uh, so remember, Sunday we need to have the uh, podcast little thing uh, submitted. And then also on Monday, I need your topic for your paper. If you guys have any questions or concerns or complaints or issues or whatever, um, please don't be afraid to uh, email me. I'm, I'm more than open for some criticism or some, hey, maybe we we'll try this or something like that. All right. Or if you have any ideas, okay, shout them out. I love uh, participation. Okay. So thank you guys for listening and we will talk to you soon.